Crushing evolution theory is fun and easy. For 50 pages of it, visit Debunking Evolution. People often say evolution is science. The reality is that the theory of evolution is obsolete science. Discoveries in molecular biology over the last 40 years have revealed many secrets of how biology really works, and it hasn't been good for evolution theory. But most people have not heard it because there has been a concerted effort to promote evolution as not just a theory but a law of science and to prevent discussion of scientific problems with it. Here you will see evidence that is fatal to evolution theory. Biologists divide all living things into groups and subgroups. The basic framework is the Linnaean system of taxonomy published in Linnaeus's expanded 10th edition of Systema Naturae in 1758. That was a century before Darwinism and it was never intended to show that one creature morphed into another. It just grouped animals with similar characteristics. But once they seized control of the study of biology, evolutionists took over the Linnaean system and have tinkered with it ever since to fit their belief that animals transform over time. Here is an evolutionist with experience in molecular biology. Francois Jacob won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1965 along with two others, for discoveries concerning genetic control of enzyme and virus synthesis. His life's work dealt mainly with the genetic mechanisms existing in bacteria and bacteriophages and with the biochemical effects of mutations. He wrote, evolution does not produce novelties from scratch. It works on what already exists, either transforming a system to give it new functions or combining several systems to produce a more elaborate one. Once life had started in the form of some primitive self-reproducing organism, further evolution had to proceed mainly through alterations of already existing compounds. New functions developed as new proteins appeared, but these were merely variations on previous themes. A sequence of a thousand nucleotides codes for a medium-sized protein. The probability that a functional protein would appear de novo by random association of amino acids is practically zero. In organisms as complex and integrated as those that were already living a long time ago, creation of entirely new nucleotide sequences could not be of any importance in the production of new information. For decades everyone agreed, but recently researchers have compared the genes of similar creatures and they found that the genes differed from just a little to a lot. They imagined different ways the genes could have morphed. Evolutionists do not know what really happened. They assume it was one of these mental explanations, and that is enough for them. But some genes are so unique even imagination fails. Orphan genes are defined as genes which lack detectable similarity to genes in other species. They typically make up 10 to 30 percent of all genes in a genome. In fact, all genome and expressed sequence tag projects to date in every taxonomic group studied so far have uncovered a substantial fraction of genes that are without known homologs. These orphans or taxonomically restricted genes are defined as being exclusively restricted to a particular taxonomic group. Evolutionists now conclude they must have assembled spontaneously de novo. The foundation of evolution theory gradual modification over time, slowly transforming genes that already exist, suddenly ran up against orphan genes, genes without parents, in every taxonomic group study so far. Looking at it objectively, the theory of evolution has been falsified. After careful study, evolutionists made a bold choice. They cut the theory's last connection to reality, declaring that the impossible is normal. Of course genes are produced de novo. The new foundation of evolution theory is, poof, there it is, which sounds like the foundation of creation by intelligent design, de novo. Evolutionists now think orphan genes are awesome. What choice do they have? For evolutionists, their theory can never die. The rest of us can see that Francois Jacob was right. Genes are long information programs for building proteins that construct operate and regulate parts of living things integrated into all their other systems. Genes just can't pop up out of nowhere. 
Orphan genes in every living thing prove that macroevolution does not represent reality and is physically impossible. It's not just genes popping up on evolutionists' imaginary tree of life. Whole parts do too. Moving up the tree, you see that parts can be lost from a creature and then exactly reinvented in the same creature millions of years later. And that might happen several times. What's more, the same part might appear independently in unrelated creatures isolated from each other. For example, they imagine wings evolved completely independently four times in insects, flying reptiles, birds, and bats. This gimmick is quite common in evolutionary science. When a creature produces light with chemicals, it is called bioluminescence. Evolutionists think bioluminescence evolved independently 40 to 50 separate times. In another study, evolutionists concluded that the cecal appendix evolved independently at least 32 separate times in mammals. By the way, it is now known that the appendix is a safe house for important gut bacteria when the intestine gets infected and flushed. Evolutionists called it useless. Wrong again. It would be shocking if random mutation, natural selection, produced anything functional, let alone the same thing twice or more from scratch. Reinventing parts over and over again leaves the foundation of the theory of evolution, descent with modification, in tatters. How did evolutionary scientists escape this dilemma? They gave it a name with the word evolution in it, either convergent or parallel evolution, according to the situation. Need a part out of the blue? Just call it convergent or parallel evolution. It's everywhere in evolutionist writings. They just casually throw out statements like, Convergent evolution is widespread across the mammal tree of life. It's not just parts popping up on evolutionists' imaginary tree of life. Whole animals do too. The most brazen example is the parallel evolution of the two types of mammals, placentals such as humans and marsupials such as kangaroos. Evolutionists tell us that each group evolved separately, yet many are remarkably similar including cats, mice, wolves, moles, flying squirrels, anteaters, and others. This is whole animal duplication, not just an individual part. A normal person would be embarrassed if their theory of random change made such claims, but you cannot embarrass a fanatic. The only reason for the convergent parallel evolution maneuver is to force the tree of life framework onto a world of uniquely designed creatures. The big surprise in the fossil record is right at the beginning. If the first living thing was a single cell, as evolutionists believe, then there should be a long series of simple tiny creatures morphing gradually into bigger and more complex creatures over hundreds of millions of years. So what do we find in the first layer of fossils above the bedrock? The Cambrian explosion. The long trail of evolution is nowhere to be found. The fossils of the Cambrian explosion are complex invertebrates, sea creatures like trilobites, sponges, worms, jellyfish, sea urchins, sea lilies, mollusks, brachiopods or lampshells, sea cucumbers, and swimming crustaceans such as Opabinia, three inches long with five eyes and a long claw arm, and Anomalocaris three feet long and the top predator in the Cambrian. Darwin understood the situation, but argued that the incompleteness of the fossil record in his day gave the illusion of an explosive event. He hoped that future discoveries of older and better preserved rocks would contain the long trail of early evolution. Wrong again. After 150 years of searching, we still have the Cambrian explosion. In the classification system biologists use, these animals are so unrelated to each other that they are in different classes or even phyla. In fact, virtually all of the phyla and classes on Earth are in the Cambrian explosion. From the early Paleozoic onward, there is little addition of new phyla and classes. Little high-level morphological innovation occurred during the subsequent 500 million years. If evolution were true, there would have been ancestors 
and transitional creatures between each genus, family, order, class, and phylum in the layers below the Cambrian explosion. But there are no fossils for any of them. This has been a constant, nagging problem for evolutionists that had to be solved. Finally, a team of evolutionists did it using their most effective tool, storytelling. First they assumed evolution occurred. Then they estimated how fast it should have happened and decided that the creatures in the Cambrian explosion had been evolving for over 250 million years before any showed up in the rocks as fossils. Yes, millions of generations of all kinds of creatures all over the world living, dying, evolving, without leaving any trace of their existence. Their story was published in the prestigious journal Science and hailed as having solved a mystery challenging evolution theory all the way back to Darwin. That is how evolutionary science works today. They tell us stories of what happened. If the consensus of evolutionary science says it, it must be so, though they can change it later. If you don't like it, you must be a creationist and a threat to civilization. For those who can still think for themselves, consider the Cambrian explosion, orphan genes, and the fraud of convergent and parallel evolution and ask yourself, why are we still talking about this antique Victorian fairy tale, the theory of evolution? Hey, I'm just saying. <laughs>